and ask you to stand as I read from the Word of God. <clears throat> it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. He said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord. Father, I pray you'd bless the reading of your word this morning, Lord. Will you give me insight to your word, Father? Give me clarity of thought, and more importantly, Lord, shut my mouth in such a manner that only your words would proceed from it. Father, my desire is to communicate your message, Lord, not promote some agenda. So, Father, help me to preach your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> You know what, uh, I think it was last year, actually, I, pre I preached out of the same passage. And uh, there's a reason why I went back to it, and I'll get to that in just a second. This church is, will be three years old on Easter. And Easter is on a different day every year, so it's not exactly Easter. I think it was April 24th of 2011 when we launched our official date. It's something like that. So we're coming on three years as a ministry. The first year we got here, we sat down here, we had just a few families, maybe 20 people. We're sitting in here, and we're actually coming together trying to build God's kingdom. There's a few people who were absolutely committed to that and said, you know what, we're going to support this ministry financially and through any means we have to with our, you know, we're going to do whatever it takes. And, and we was able to do that, praise God. Well, after that first year, we had our, our team sat down and we was talking about uh, the Awana program. Well, anybody who has any knowledge of Awanas knows that, A, it's a great program. It's a great program, <laughs> top-notch, I mean, it is a great program. And B, it's huge. It takes a lot of hands to pull that one off. Doesn't happen by accident. Now, you can fly by the seat of your pants and do some things. You ain't doing Awanas like that. You, if you do, it's not going to be very effective. And so what we did is we sat down that first year. We sat down and we had a conversation. Actually, it was at, a, at a, like a luau party. You remember that? We're all sitting around with like Hawaiian shirts and stuff. We're barbecuing. And we were talking about possibly having an Awana program. And we came to the realistic conclusion at the end of that meeting, we did not have the manpower to pull it off. We just didn't. And so we postponed it a year. And the following year came back, and we said, all right, we're going to do it then. And that's when we actually initiated the program. And so we had it two years now. And it's a big deal. And I remember the first time I announced it from here on a Sunday morning. I said, we're going to move forward with an Awana program. Everybody went crazy, hooping and hollering and clapping because they saw the need. But you know the scripture says about counting the cost. Amen? We need to count the cost. And there is a cost involved. There is a sacrifice that goes with that. But the question is, are your kids worth it? That answer should be an easy answer. <clears throat> I had a, those of you who know I'm a police officer, I used to hate sharing that with people. People love cops or they hate them. There seems to be no in between. I didn't get an amen, Ron, I'm surprised. But in any event, I share it today because um, it's, it's applicable. Almost in every time I preach, there's always something. And uh, in my career as a policeman, one of the things that I've, I've come to realize was uh, that I was teaching the D.A.R.E. program. I was afforded the opportunity to teach the D.A.R.E. program, which is an anti-drug program, uh, to the kids. And it was not something that I desired to do. I didn't even really know I liked kids. That's the truth. And so what ends up happening is I get this opportunity to teach, and I believe that God had given me a latent talent to teach and a passion for people that I didn't know I had, especially kids. But what ended up happening in that is God used my job, my secular job as a policeman, to actually prepare me for the call to ministry that he placed in my life. What ended up happening is like in every area of my life, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. I love to do what I do or I won't do it. That's just me. I poured myself into this program, and I fell in love with what I was doing. And I really believed in the program and in these kids that I was teaching. When you have a kid come up to you in kindergarten, sits on your lap, and you know, this kid doesn't even like cops. You know he don't because he told you so. 
And then a couple weeks into it, he comes and he sits on your lap and he wraps his arms around you. He's a kid, he's, he's a kindergarten, five or six years old, and he gives you a hug. And he says, I love you, Officer Friendly. And he doesn't even know me, really. Two visits. And then he says, I wish you were my daddy. And I look at him and I smile and I say, oh, man, I'm looking at him. I wish, you, I, wish, I wish your dad too, you know. And he tells me, well, my dad's in jail. You know, that another kid telling my twins, brothers, good kids too. Second or third grade, their father was dead. Second graders, you know. And so this, this bond is taking place between these kids, and I just fell in love with what I did. My heart melted. Then I had some smart aleck cop on the police department. says, you wasting your time. You got to understand, I was an aggressive policeman. I'm hitting the bushes, going into alleys. I'm looking for bad guys, and I just like taking, especially burglars. I love taking burglars to jail. Love it. Dragging them out of your house and putting them in their new house. I love it. And I was aggressive. As a policeman, I was very aggressive. And to come off the street and to go into the classroom, I brought the same passion with me. I had another officer come to me and tells me, he says, man, you're wasting your talent, your abilities in a classroom. And I understand where he's coming from because he felt like a good quality caliber policeman should be on the street. And I told him, I said, I don't see it that way. To me, I felt like I could do more good in a classroom any day on my worst day than I could on my best day on the streets. I felt that I made more of an impact in the classroom. I really believed that from the bottom of my heart. And he looks at me and he tells me, that's just ridiculous, you know, and blah, blah, blah. He tells me, um, he says, you're, uh, this is what he says. Actually, I, had, I got called. They have a, a meeting. It's called a comp stat meeting. It's when they call the whole department together. Everybody's wearing uniforms, their dress suits, and their hats on. They're all, it's a big deal. And you stand in front of the chief, and you have to give an account from everybody. There's major pressure. And they asked me this question. They said, Sergeant Burgos, they said, what do you think about the D.A.R.E. program? And I went on and I told them what I thought about it. And then they sharp come back. We have statistics to show that the program's failing. It's not working. And so my response to that was this. I said, first of all, statistics in, in surveys can be manipulated to say whatever you want them to. It depends on who's taking them. Right. Secondly, I said, the pro those surveys do not measure intangible things. Folks, I'm talking to you about a police department, but I want you to try to examine this through a spiritual lens as well, what I'm saying. I said, measures, it doesn't measure intangible things. He says, whoa, well, was a statistic show in 1981 in Los Angeles, California, when the D.A.R.E. program came to be that drug use among adolescents was 3%. Today it's at 8%. Well, how do you respond to that? And I'm in front of the whole police department. I said, well, that's a simple solution. I said, for, there's, there's a lot of variables in that equation you're not taking into account. Population and so on and so forth. The transient population. You know, there's a lot of things that you're not accounting for. And number one, I said, one of the things you cannot possibly account for is this. Should the D.A.R.E. program never come to be in Los Angeles, California, 1981, and the drug, what would the percentage be then? Would it be 8%? I submit you'd be higher. Okay, now you can't measure that because surveys don't measure that. Do you understand? So I'm sitting here and I'm defending this. And it, basically, the bottom line came to this. I said, this is what he said, well, we're going to cut the program. We're getting rid of it because it doesn't work. I said, that's your opinion. You're entitled to that. I said, but if one child is reached, then it was worth it. Amen. And then the smart aleck response is, you would put all that effort and all that energy and all those resources into one child. I said, absolutely. He said, that's ridiculous. And I said, would it be so ridiculous if the one child was yours? It wouldn't be, would it? Right. And that's the response I got was a quiet room. Because anybody with children knows the answer to that one. You know, we have statistics that crime continues to rise on the streets, so since it doesn't work, let's just get rid of the police department. <laughs> We're not, it's not working. Well, we have a proof that the seven fire ambulances or the ambulances in the city of Hammond is not enough, so we're going to get rid of two. That doesn't make any sense to me. If seven's not enough, you put ten, amen? You put more resources. You, put, you do more. You don't do less. It's just backwards. It's ridiculous. But you know what that tells me? That tells me that the society we live in today, they don't care about our kids. They don't. They have their own priorities, and your, your kids are at the bottom of the barrel. They're at the bottom of the agenda. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, these disciples asked. Who's the greatest? This conversation was precipitated. You don't see it in this chapter, chapter 18. But in another gospel, if you read Mark, you see the disciples are arguing over who's the greatest. 
And so when Jesus chimes in and he says, at this point, that's what it's saying, at this time, at the time Jesus comes to the disciples and he asks, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they're, they're all, they feel stupid. They're looking at each other like, nothing. <laughs> Jesus is like, are you talking about something? What are you talking about? They said, well, we just kind of want to move. And he's just like, what? He said, we was wondering who the greatest in the kingdom of heaven was. And Jesus said, he called the child unto himself. He said, stand among them. He says, verse 3, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like, this, the, become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. When becoming like children, the church believes, I, I think the church believes today that being, being childlike means being childish. That we can rant and rave and cry when we don't get our way. That's not what it means. Amen. Being childlike is being humble in spirit. That's right. Kids generally take direction. Kids are selfish too. They are. But kids are also trusting. Right. I remember uh, as a kid, Man, we used to get hammered. Uh, uh, Tina shared a story with me about uh, her walking home from school and a lady trying to lure one of the kids into the car. But these kids weren't stupid. So you, you were with them, right? And the other kid took off running, crying. Because <laughs> you got in like a car passed as the lady was coming near. Am I correct on that? And it was you. The car passed and gave you an opportunity to run. As a God, that was a divine appointment. God sent a car to separate the two. And so kids are trusting, generally trusting. We teach them not to be. Because you can't be, because they'll get chewed up and spit out. But kids, are typically by nature, are trusting. Me and my friend was walking down the, uh, we were walking by the railroad tracks, and a guy pulls up, Zay! Hey! He's an older gentleman. You owe me some money for that baseball I gave you. And I looked at him, I said, what baseball? My friend snatches me by the collar. He's about a year older than me. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Army. He's very, very smart. Mine's always going 240 miles an hour. My dumb behind's thinking about a baseball. I said, baseball, my friend grabs me, he goes, get away from him. And he goes, come here. And uh, he says, he's trying to lure us. That's what my friend tells me. I'm like, uh, and I just couldn't believe it. No, man, he's just, he's an old guy. He's a nice guy. My friend said, let's go. There's some space between us. We teach our kids not to be trusting. The truth is, by nature, they are. They trust you. You say, come here, I have a piece of candy for you. They'll come every time, every time, until you teach them to be fearful and to not trust. Jesus says, become childlike to be trusting. I find it interesting that the disciples are asking about this. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They've lost sight of their eternal perspective and they're worried about positions of pleasure, positions of, uh, of, of uh, status, positions of, uh, of, a of authority. They're worried about positions. And you may ask yourself, wow, that's pretty selfish of them. Let me ask you something, church. Have we sat here and so why do we waste our time with these kids? We don't have the help. Why don't we just get rid of the program? And you put programs over people? You put policy over people? I mean, we have kids here. There was, there was probably 20 of them here. And there's kids missing. And we, you know what? The men's ministry is more important. Statistics show that. The women's ministry is more important. Statistics show that. Never mind the kids. What about the nursery? That's babysitting? You heard Amber talking about the little two-year-olds going home saying, my grass, God made the grass, mom. You know, what kind of emphasis do we put into our children? Are we pouring into our kids like we should? He says, therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And here's important. He says, and whoever welcomes a little child in this, like this in my name welcomes me, Jesus said. But whoever, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck. Now, I'm going to draw your attention to something here. These children, how do you cause a child to sin? Well, for one, we just kind of, we demean them. They're not that important. They're just kids. I think you can teach a kid about sin at a very early age, and we neglect to do that, or we demean them. That's a problem, folks. We have a responsibility to invest in our children. We do. They're not getting it in school by that, I promise you. A school that's not even allowed to pray anymore. In a school where they're not allowed, they're trying to take the uh, one nation under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance. They're not getting it in school. Here's what I want to show you, though. Go to Matthew chapter 19, verse 13. That's one chapter over. Turn over. Jesus just tells them, 
He just tells them about the kids and how important they are. Look at 19, verse 13. Look what happens. Then a little child, or a little, then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. One chapter later, one chapter later, in chapter 18, they bring the kids to Jesus, and Jesus is like, oh, Jesus is like, okay, the kids are coming. They're like, oh, man, get the kids out of here. You know, that they're, and Jesus just tells them, hey, man, these kids are important. One chapter later, I don't know how much time has passed, but not that much time. Passes, and then they bring kids again, and Jesus, then his disciples are like, all right, that was, that was earlier. That was a month ago. We had time for the kids. Today we don't. That's what we do, folks. You know, the Iwana programs come to a close, and we, that's a good thing because our leaders need time to recover. But then you have parents who ask, well, what, what are we doing on Tuesday nights, Pastor? And I said, that's a good question. Because the Iwana program comes to an end. What are we doing on Tuesday nights? We're still having prayer service, but the numbers in the prayer service will dwindle because the parents have no place to take their kids. So Maria and Bardo and, and Bob and Nicole and Lavanya are all willing to take a week and do something different. It won't be as structured, which is good, as they go outside and play as the weather gets better. But we can still have our prayer service. People say, what's your point? Here's my point. That same thing will happen on Sunday mornings without your children's program, without your children's church. You think I'm kidding? Pick a church, any church. Find one that does not have a youth program or a children's program and see how they're doing in attendance. Parents want a place to send their kids. Parents, when they come to church, they want the whole family to be able to participate. And you know what? These kids, they require people to invest in them. You can't send them back there. They, as I found it very interesting that Lavanya's group of Sparks was how many? There was a bunch of them. They took up two stairs. And Tina and Maria said she's the only Sparks leader. The largest group had the least help. And Tina and, and, and Maria had the help. They had to come out of the office to help her with that. Now, here's the deal. You have to count the cost. Is it worth it? Is the ministry worth it? Should we have a children's program? We don't have the help. Scrap it. What did Jesus say? Those who welcome one of these kids in my name, you're welcoming me. We're saying we ain't got no time for that. And we're back to the same place the disciples were. Who's the greatest? I'm more important. My prayer service is more important, or whatever it is that we're doing is more important than the doggone kids program. That's what we're saying. We got a year to think about that. People say, hey, Pastor, you preached about this last year. Well, you know what? It's still true. And just like the disciples in chapter 18, back in chapter 19, they had to hear it again. If you read your, you, you read your Bible, all throughout the New Testament, the same messages are over and over and over and over again. You know why? Because we're hard headed and we forget. That's why. Amen? I'm going to ask you to turn all the way to the back of your Bibles to the book of Jude. That, my friend, was free. <laughs> I wasn't even planning on talking about that this morning. But as these kids sang these songs, it just warmed my heart to hear them say, approved workmen are not ashamed. Boys and girls for his service claim. Hail Awanas on the march for youth. Hail Awanas holding forth the truth. Building lives on the word of God, Awana stands. My goodness. That is what it's all about, folks. Your kids aren't going to get it anywhere else. And here's what will happen. If we don't offer a, child, a, a children's ministry here at this church, there's another one that does. You think I'm kidding? When we launched, the year we launched, we did not have a youth program and we did not have an Awana program. And I strongly encourage parents who had kids in those age groups to stay at the churches that they were at or wherever they had their kids, because we had nothing to offer them, nothing. I urged them to stay for the sake of their children. Some of them said, absolutely not. We're coming to support this ministry, and we're going to use our kids to help build those ministries. And that's what we've done. But I believe that it is absolutely important, it is absolutely important that we invest in these kids. And if we're not willing to do that, there's, there were some, there some, there some parents who took their kids to other churches to their programs so that their child was getting invested in because we didn't have the resources to do it. That's a fact. Now listen to this. I went to a, they called it a mini conference. It was a one day, two hour thing where I sat down and we ate. They fed us. They know how to get Baptists there, let me tell you. <laughs> they call us there, they, they feed us, and it was some good food. But anyway, me, Bardo, and Jason went. And this is what they said. Uh, I was actually, the, the conference was about something totally unrelated. I ran into a pastor friend of mine I haven't seen in a while, and this is what he told me. 
he said, man, our numbers are getting better. He's talking about the numbers of people in attendance. He says, we're, you know, we were down as low as 40 people in attendance. He said, we're doing better now. We're probably around 60. We're closing in on 80 is what we're used to having. I said, oh, and this is what he said. Listen to me, folks. Profound. He said, our biggest problem that I've discovered, he says, is there's, there's a direct correlation between our inability or unwillingness to train leaders. That's what he said to me. And I looked at him, I said, really? He said, yes. You know, we need to learn how to lead, we do. You know, there's only so many people who are leading when they're all dead and gone, we're gonna be in trouble. Amen, that's the fact, that's, that's true. The Awana program, what's the goal? Listen, what was the goal, remember? I pledge allegiance to the Awana Club, which stands for the Awana, or the Awana flag, which stands for the Awana clubs, whose goal is to reach what? Boys and who grow into men and, okay, to reach boys and girls for what? With the gospel of Christ and train them to serve him. That's the goal of the Iwana program. You want to scrap it? I don't know about that. 